And so generally, if we were going to explain the main treatises or the main uh, extensive explanatory text of the Madhyamaka, then the, the text which is primarily concerned with ascertaining and confirming the view of the middle way 
is the um, fundamental verses on wisdom by Nagarjuna, together with his other uh, treatises, which are called the collected reasonings of Nagarjuna. The Omaki Gumbots over the Parisha Bate, the Nopo I am the Gunday Shabaki, the Omajibjava, the Nijo Yamare. And then the text which is primarily concerned with ascertaining the meditation or practice of the middle way is the text called the 400 verses on the middle way by uh, the Arya Deva. And then the text, which is primarily concerned with the behavior, the conduct of the middle way, uh, is the text by the great Bodhisattva. Um, <clears throat> uh, sorry, the text called the engaging in the um, the way of the Bodhisattva by the great Arya and great Bodhisattva Shantideva. Then Tawata, Bomba, Juba, then Lam Deva, the Jebatin, Pashabate. And then the text which fully presents the view, meditation, conduct, path, and result of the middle way is the text by Chandrakirti, which is called Entering into the Middle Way. And so then these are what are referred to as the four great texts of the middle way. And there have been a great uh, number of additional explanatory texts written by the scholars, both of India and Tibet. And these are very vast and profound texts. Uh, that the that the that the that that the that the that that the 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 that uh, to go through these really extensive texts, then we're going to then study here this text of Milarepa, this uh, spiritual song of Milarepa, which contains the essential meaning or the essence of the Middle Way teachings. Mm -hmm. The new day in my end of that, um, your bottom, your bottom, my bad chip up and tap. Ah, on it, that you mean you got us or buggy, tie your down, to what get the tower key, what that the new tower teller, the new woman tower, sin of the new summer your days. So, generally, what is meant by this middle way, and we can understand a lot from this word middle that it's lying in the center. And so often in the middle way, we talk about being free from the four extremes or the eight conceptual elaborations. And those four extremes are the extremes of the permanence of existence or the annihilation of nothingness. Both of those or neither of those. So not relying, not being in the, any of those extremes, but being in the middle is what's referred to as the view of the middle way. <laughs> ตบตาเดบตบตาเดบตบตาเดบยังเนี่ยนี่จะเต็มแบบเชบะกิตาวะกันทาละซุ่มเดบะเต็มเนี่ยนี่ตะเคลาสุบะกังกันทาละเนี
or they fall into an extreme view of an annihilation or a nihilistic view. And so if you fall into any such extreme view, then that is not the view of the middle way. And so um, not falling into any such view, such as a view grasping at existence, which we refer to as a view of permanence, or a view grasping at nothingness or absence, which we call the view of annihilation, not falling into any such extremes uh, is the true nature or the true meaning of what we said, what we call them, the middle way. Then <laughs> So there's a quote that says that when we say it exists, that is the extreme of permanence. And when we say it doesn't exist or it's non-existent, that is the extreme of annihilation. And abiding in neither or any such extreme, in, uh, in, in no such extreme, is what's called the middle way. So many people have a very strong grasping at the true existence of the self, and that is the view of existence or permanence. And then others have a, a type of view that sees um, that the self only exists in this life and is annihilated at the time of death, or otherwise <laughs> just sees a conventional reality as something non-existent. And those are what are referred to as uh, the extremes of annihilation. And so the extreme of permanence then is a superimposition. It's saying that something is something that it's not. And then um, the extreme of annihilation is a deprecation, meaning it's saying it's not something that it is. And so falling into any such extreme is not the middle way, and the middle way is that which is free from such extremes. <laughs> Tenet systems or four schools. 
And so there are two, which are called the common schools, which are the Babaishika and the Swatantrika. And then the two uncommon schools, which are the mind only and middle way schools. And so of those four, the supreme view, the ultimate view, or the supreme view is held by the middle way or Madhyamaka school. And so I think all of you know who Jetsumila Repa is. Uh, he was the master who, the master of realization, the master of uh, Dharma, who in one lifetime attained the supreme state of Vajradhara in the state of Buddhahood. And uh, this text then is uh, about the middle way, and it's referred to as a song of the view, or a spiritual song of the view. And uh, Milarepa had many disciples, both human and non-human, and this particular song was sang to non-human disciples that was particularly um, requested or received by the five Tseringla uh, spirit uh, deities. And so... Uh, Milarepa sang this song of realization coming from his realization of that middle way view. So Ken Amish said he's going to slowly read the beginning part, which is uh, called the, it's just in Tibetan it's referred to as setting the stage for the teaching. So I heard at one time the great Jetsun whose name was Glorious Laughing Vajra, was known, whose name, Glorious Laughing Vajra, was known everywhere, the yogin above all other yogins, Milarepa, was residing at Chubar in his Nirmanakaya fortress together with a great assembly of wisdom deities who were none other than the mandala of his own enlightened body, speech, mind, and great bliss. The <laughs> So then the place where Milarepa was practicing then, the place where he was, was this uh, place called Chubar, which is in the mountain called Umalaya. And so uh, at that time, now at that time, from this point, it's going to describe those who were there to receive the teaching. So it says, the haughty generals of the eight classes of neither gods nor demons, each one accompanied by troops of his own type and women dakinis. Uh, this says, as translators, this is a mistranslation. I'm going to have to ask Ken Ramshay exactly what this means. But 
appearing in youthful and charming beautiful form, fully bedeckled with robes flapping in the wind, various gems, long doshell necklaces jingling, and semdo necklaces. And so on, accompanied by their many retinues of servants and assistants, all came to the space before Jetson. The neither gods nor demons, then the neither gods nor demons let rain of uh, let fall a rain of various flowers on him, made offerings of worship and various instances of music to him, and set forth an array of the finest foods and combustibles before him, and then petitioned him with requests. So now they were going to uh, request the teachings from Milarepa. Yeah, that's right, you must do. That's it. うん、だったんで、ママに、え、まずき、え、もうじゃなかったんで、ただ、そんまだわ、ちょ。あ。全部で茶で言うで。で、ね、かんねで言うでしな。ただ、ローハマラや。私たちの状態は、全部まで。で
Jetson, please give us, neither gods nor demons assembled here, uh, a teaching of definitive dharma, one that shows the extent of realization that has come into your enlightened mind, the understanding of the Buddhas of the three times, about which it has been said, there is nothing except, except for this place led to by the ultimate path. ทุกกุมบะเตตวะกาเรเตยะบะยินะวะตะเตอะเนมาเจตวะยินะสุนโหเตตะทินิบิชุเตเตนะเตเนเนเตเนเตเนเตเนเตเนเตเนเตเนเ
ตัดเตะกระเชิดสินะจมมอลลังมาสินะตีลังมาตะโอเคกับปาดดาเตลังมาเนี่ยยอสุนดีสเตนิยันสุนดีลังมาสินะกระเชิดสรันเชมะเต
many of these uh, demigods or uh, spirits, worldly spirits and so on, came before Milarepa, causing many obstacles to his practice and showing different types of uh, miraculous displays. And Milarepa, through the power of his own uh, samadhi and his own power of, over miraculous display, and through his realization of dharma, were able to tame all of these deities and spirits and uh, place them or bring them into the dharma. So there's many, many stories like that in the uh, biography of Milarepa. Jatula, <laughs> And even the, uh, these five Tsarima deities, first when Milarepa was uh, practicing in his cave, then um, these, these five Tsarima deities were coming and disturbing him and causing obstacles and showing miracles, uh, showing different types of uh, miraculous displays to obstruct his practice. And then Milarepa, through the own power of his own samadhi and by the power of his blessing and by giving Dharma teachings to these five sitting deities, he was able to pacify them, and they eventually gained faith in him, and he brought them into the Dharma. That is, um, dancing, gunda, mama, the yin, rock, pumon, zima, na, lamit, chota, semji, te, chenu, mudok, kelan, manam, kalan, pornatar, sumari. That is, dawa, numa, gana, na, yang, ane, chenen, chenen, jesu, malare, bakan, dana, chushu. And so, these five, it says, at the time of the early winter months, five mind-ravishingly beautiful girls aroused the mind for supreme unsurpassed enlightenment and swore to give whichever cities were desired, then flying off into the sky out of sight, disappeared. And so in the previous months then, these five uh, Tsarima deities had come before Milarepa and had aroused that mind of supreme bodhicitta, and Milarepa had given them the bodhisattva vows, and they had then also uh, made pledges to protect the Dharma and to, to benefit sentient beings, and they took such uh, pledges to do that and then left, and now they've come back. Sukena, <laughs> And so, <clears throat> once again, you amazing five have appeared in this winter night's brilliant moonlight as ladies so excellent as to be manifestations. Having assumed a charming form of dance with robes fluttering in the wind and beautified by the Doshal necklace, leading lady, you flattered me then. The haughty neither gods nor spirits of the eight classes accompanied by the army's regiments, soldiers, and retinue of the same type made offerings of clouds of offerings, filling the sky of food with hundreds of flavors and various kinds of music, and then petitioned me for the definitive understanding. You are the troublesome gods and ghosts of apparent existence, aren't you? So then... Uh, these five Tsarima deities appeared in the form of uh, beautiful women, 
And they came before Milarepa and supplicated him to turn the wheel of Dharma, offering the uh, mandala and all the various offerings that were described above. And so, uh, and then requested these teachings of the definitive meaning. So that's the essence of what was said there, the point. That in the land of Chizum Mombuki, then the Chibapu, and then Sorata, and the Chuji, and the young Midung Chu Masson was a con shoe, she went in by Indu, Tin Hansi, Hande Malas, took the get on the Navalini, not the Mirto, the Kunjani, that Jajo Mazel, not the new son, that in the Tende, and the Lama Nasik Land of Mombuki, and the Sorata by Mayena. Then you come here, and it's your man, you don't get cheated at the Masu in the Nichian to Yabunion, then you come with the Kongi Tugul and Tongue Bakatoba. What did that Tanya Masu mean? So that is a Malade Bakishajina. And so then, uh, you are the troublesome gods and ghosts of apparent existence, aren't you? If you're the ones who spoke such words, these are meaning the words of petitioning him to teach then you are to listen here. If I am to explain with true speech, then each of you listen. Now stop all your noise and listen to this song. So all of these uh, spirits and demigods uh, made all of these supplications and offerings for Milarepa to teach. And he said, okay, if you have requested me as such, if you've said these words and made these offerings and made this supplication, then I'm going to teach you. So listen well. <laughs> え、その世界を渡り迷うんで、でね、ジャズマラでバコンギアンテラね、シャジナナね、たまちでそのイエンス。でね、ジャジョマゼルのニュースでね、チャンスをだ、ディジチュシャワキクノンダン。でね、コン
And so, <clears throat> when we are receiving Dharma teachings or even explaining the Dharma, if we treat it in the same way that we teach in ordinary school in modern society, then if we teach it the same way, we, or if we engage in it in the same way that we would engage in a mathematics class or a language class, then um, we could gain some understanding of Dharma, but we will not receive the same blessings, benefits, experiences, and realizations from that Dharma. So we need to, when we are receiving Dharma teachings, when we are studying the Dharma, we need to generate the correct motivation for doing that. We need to generate that mind of bodhicitta together with faith in the Dharma, respect for the Dharma, and diligence in practice. And if we're able to do that, then our Dharma practice will proceed in a way that is in accordance with authentic Dharma. So generally, if you don't have faith, belief, and respect for the Dharma, you can still study it. You can study it as just a, a subject of study, like a worldly subject of study. And from that perspective, then it's still, many of the things explained in Dharma could still benefit in some way. But really, if we're going to approach Dharma as Dharma, and we're going to really practice Dharma, then we really need to have the correct motivation together with faith, belief, trust, and respect. We need to have all of those complete. Uh, Tabata and so it's similar to uh, you know modern day meditation. So there are a great many people who are practicing meditation these days who don't have any faith or belief in the Dharma. 
uh, but they do still receive some kind of immediate or temporary benefit in terms of their own psychological state. They receive some peace of mind and so on. But when we're really talking about the ultimate benefits of Buddhism in terms of attaining the ultimate state of Buddhahood, or gaining the qualities of realization and experience of real uh, authentic dharma, then in that case, then you have to practice uh, dharma appropriately or correctly in a way uh, that follows authentic dharma instruction. And we can't just merely seek out uh, some peaceful state of mind or a temporary alleviation of some difficulties. And so, uh, if we are only seeking that kind of temporary alleviation of difficulties and so on, then we will not receive that ultimate or greater benefit from that practice. And so with whatever uh, type of ambition or motivation with which we take up a practice or a study of Dharma, we will receive uh, benefits and results which accord with or which are in harmony with the motivation with which we approach it. And so if we practice Dharma or meditate with a intention or a motivation merely to give us some happiness to our mind or to give us some peace of mind, then uh, the result of that will then be just a peaceful state of mind, merely a peaceful state of mind. But if we are practicing Dharma with the intention to benefit all sentient beings, and in order to do that, to attain the ultimate state of Buddhahood, if we approach our meditation with that type of motivation, then ultimately we will attain a result which accords with that cause or with that motivation. And ultimately we will be able to benefit a great many sentient beings and attain the states of liberation and omniscience. So that is a particularity or a particular aspect of uh, karmic cause and result. Whatever kind of seed we plant, whatever type of cause we accrue, we will see a concordant result or a result that accords with that cause. Thus. <laughs> So that's what's meant then in this uh, this line that says, now stop all your noise and listen to this song. So he's instructing them to listen to the Dharma appropriately with the correct motivation and to stop uh, speaking and just focus on the teaching. Uh, <laughs> so generally, the sentient beings of the three realms, samsara, have various kinds of enlightenment that they assert. 
they are dualistic there are dualistic views that grasp at I and there are various ways of behavior that go with them. They are based on viewing a self very many indeed. There are based on viewing a self very many indeed. But this one the ตัวคอนซอมคอร์บเซนจินาเซนตอนนานซูจินเดอร์คอนซอมคอนซอมมีกับคอนก็คอนซอมเดอร์ว่าจะโดนเนี่ยเดอร์เซนจินเดอร์
ทุกคนที่ทุกคนที่ทุกคนที่ทุกคนที่ทุกคนที่ทุกคนที่ทุกคนที่ทุกคนที่ทุกคนที่ทุกคนที่ทุกคนที่ทุกคนที่ทุก
grasping at I, and all of these various things come from, all their various assertions come from that uh, self-grasping mind or that grasping at true existence. ตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาต
And so then, for example, people who believe in uh, past and future lives, that is what we refer to in Buddhism as the um, the authentic view of the worldly person. That means that they protect the the um, the principle of causality, of karmic cause and result. So a person who has that belief is going to uh, maintain that principle of karmic cause and result in terms of uh, considering what will be of benefit both to this life and future lives, and uh, not only for this life, but in future lives, and therefore will engage in accomplishing virtues and abandoning non-virtues or viceful behaviors. And so for a person who doesn't accept past and future lives, then they are merely going to work for the comforts of this life and ignore the uh, the possibilities or the the effects of that could fall into future lives as they don't exist, uh, assert the existence of future life, and therefore do not maintain that principle of karmic cause and result. And so we can see then that based on various types of views, we can see these different types of behavior that come as a result of having that view. And similarly, for people who assert the existence of a controller of the world, a god who is the uh, the controller and creator of the world, then uh, <clears throat> the primary kind of way of conducting oneself is to supplicate and to pray to that god for uh, liberation and for your desires. And so the main kind of conduct that follows through with a view of believing in that kind of God is the conduct of praying to and having faith and belief in that God. And so for people who primarily believe in a creator slash um, uh, controller of the world, then their primary kind of practice or their primary behavior that accords with their religion then is to please that God and to pray to that God. Whereas a person who does not believe in such a controlling God, uh, uh, a creator and controlling God, then uh, they're not going to focus on praying to some kind of God, but are going to focus on the what is to be accepted and what is to be abandoned in terms of karmic cause and result. <laughs> So for Buddhists, we do not accept, uh, we do not purport to, uh, we do not um, assert a creator God. We do not accept such a creator God. And so um, we are primarily concerned then with um, uh, with karmic cause and result. As the Buddha said, I have shown you the path 
and it's up to you to follow it. Um, uh, liberation is up to you. And so uh, we take refuge in the Buddha as he who showed us the path. And after uh, the path has been shown, then it's up to us to put that into practice. And so the main behavior or conduct of a Buddhist then is to protect that principle of karma cause and result and then put into, uh, for oneself then, to to engage, uh, taking that as a basis, sorry, karma cause and result, taking that as a basis then to engage in practice and study of the Dharma in uh, in uh, connection with or in uh, with the ambition to obtain liberation. And so also within Buddhism, we, we have uh, three vehicles of Buddhism. We have the, uh, the Theravada, or the, uh, the, the, the vehicle of the elders, or the early tradition. We have the Mahayana tradition. And we have the tradition of the secret mantra, or the tantric tradition. So with those three, we have three different views. And in accordance with those three views, we have three types of conduct. So there's another way of, de of describing like uh, three vehicles, which one is the, the hearers as one vehicle, the second being the solitary realizers, and the third being the, uh, the Mahayana, or the great vehicle teachings. And what I described before was taking uh, like Hinayana, Mahayana, and Vajrayana as the three vehicles. So there's two different ways of discussing that. Then you may do yet. Data was sent among us in the Dinita, Sendi could come to the Tangina, Dad, Tedan Sendi could move out of Samba, and they come out of Mambuji over Tedan. Then they are the Chuluk and Nanaya, and they did Suzuki and they did Tedita Tower. Then they there are, based on viewing itself, very many indeed. So according to all of the various uh, interests and attitudes of sentient beings, then there are a great many different types of views, as well as according to all of these various religious traditions and philosophical tenet systems, there are also many different types of views. So then it says, there are, based on doing itself, very many indeed. And so it says there are, based on doing itself, very many indeed. So um, the this this sentence is kind of like a, um, anyway, it's kind of confusing grammar, but it's basically just saying that uh, there are a great many views of the self. That's the essence of it. And then so Milarepa goes on to say, well, if that's the case, then what is the view of Buddhism? What is the Buddhist view? And so, complying with your type of mind, you ones of lesser mental ability, the all-knowing Buddha did teach that everything exists. And so, in order to lead beings, that is, in a, a superficial level of truth, um, 
<clears throat> that is the what is often referred to as the conventional truth, then, the Buddha taught that all of the phenomena of samsara and nirvana, all of the aggregates and the sense spheres, uh, sensory objects and so forth, he did teach that they exist. And and then he says, from the standpoint of the superfactual truth, this is a, an alternate translation of the um, absolute truth, but I think you should read the footnote because it's actually very informative. Uh, the translation of relative truth is really incomplete. So uh, from the standpoint of superfactual truth, there are no, let alone blockages, even Buddhas themselves. <clears throat> and so, um, <clears throat> in, when we talk about it in the true reality, uh, the Buddha says then that there are no aggregates, there is no samsara and nirvana, there are no objects of the senses, there's no karma, there's no result uh, that truly exists. There is not only that, there is no truly existing Buddha path or result. And so one of the most, or the most important point within the middle way teachings is what we call the two truths. So Nagarjuna said that all of the Buddhist teachings are contained within these two truths, or are, in brief, they are brought down to those two truths. And those two truths are the uh, superficial, or the conventional, or fictitious truth, and the ultimate truth. ตัดเดคุณจบสิดิคาเดดิสินะตองตามบาดะเดมคุณจบสิดิเซเตกิเอ่อยินดิเดนเตยงเมยอยู่เลยเว้ยจุมบันดอยงเมยอยู่เลย
are truly existing. In the ultimate reality, none of them truly exist. That's what we're going to do. 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 That's what we're going And the reason why that's difficult is because all of the things that we think are real, everything that we believe in and see, are said to be false. And so everything that we see with our eyes or hear with our ears, anything that is the object of our six consciousnesses, our six、uh, senses, then six consciousnesses, everything that we see with them, we grasp as being true. And then I said then that none of those things are truly existing. They are all a confused or mistaken perception that they are all false or fictitious. Then, oh man, you walk in on it. That that day you can see, see you, see the new vision. Then, when you go in the Zimbabwe, you know, see the new vision. Then, when you come to Zimbabwe, you are the you see the same. Then, that 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 day, you can do the same. Then, when you go to the new vision, you are the you see the same. Then, that 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 day, you can do the same. Then, that 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 day, you can do the same. Then, that 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 day, you can do the same. And so, in the entry to the middle way of Chandra Kirti, he gives definitions of the two truths, and he says that、um, everything that is seen by a mistaken mind, together with the mistaken mind that sees it, is the fictitious or false truth. And Everything that is seen, together with the seer,、um, that is seen by the arya or noble beings, is the ultimate truth. And so, everything,、uh, the mind, together with everything that it can engage of a worldly person, an ordinary worldly being, is the fictitious truth. Then, that that I'm talking about, make in the doing the method that Tom did here, right? And so, for example, we see this flower that's sitting right in front of us. And、um, <clears throat> and we see that, and we see it as something that's truly there, that's truly existing. We say that's there, that exists. And so when you ask why is that true, why does that exist, you say because I saw it. And so that is what we call the fictitious truth. Then I saw a man with a metal earbud. He touched his head. So this is that. So the monkey, he took the metal and turned it into a thing. ただのメトで電波飛ぶのを捨ててるし、経営者で。だって謎を解くメイクの問題、問題ジャンジー、ただメトで電波飛ぶよりでもね、ネロと飛ぶよりもね、捨ててるし、経営者で。だねメトで電
And so, what is it that we allow to decide whether that, uh, who is the decider? Who, who decides whether that flower exists for us or not, truly? And that is our eye, because we say we saw it with our eye. So, because we saw it with our eye, we say that that flower truly exists. And, <clears throat> but when we really examine, when we go into an examination as to whether that flower truly exists or not, then we find that it does not exist. So the mere appearance of that to our eye consciousness is what's referred to as the fictitious truth or the false truth. Uh, because why is that? And it's because it is something which is appearing to a mistaken consciousness. So our eye consciousness is something that is a mistaken consciousness, and that which is seen by that mistaken consciousness is referred to as the fictitious truth. And so if we, it is seen similar to the way we see something in a dream. And in a dream, we see some object, think that it's true, even though it's not truly existing. We think it's true in the dream, similar to our vision of the flower in our awakened state. So uh, it appears to us temporarily uh, in our uh, mistaken viewpoint, it appears to us as though it were true and truly existing. But when we really look into it with an examination to find the reality of the flower, to find whether that flower truly exists or not, it is found that it is not truly existing and that it merely appears as a dream-like appearance. And so the not true establishment of the flower, or the fact that the flower does not truly exist, is what's referred to as the ultimate truth of the flower. <laughs> And so, uh, this flower sitting in front of us, is it there or not? Is there a flower here? And so, who, who knows whether there's a flower here? So, the, the eye knows, right? The eye sees it. And in that case, then we're saying that the eye is like a valid uh, cognition. It's a valid seer. It is what is establishing or validating the existence of a flower for us, right? And but uh, but we already discussed that the eye can't uh, validate the true existence of that. That our eye consciousness is a mistaken consciousness. But for us to validate the existence of a flower, whether it exists or not, we have no witness. We have no one to call upon other than our eye. Our eye itself is what lets us know that it exists. But just because our eye sees something, that cannot establish that the thing truly exists. So even these days scientists say that uh, when we look at a flower and we see the multicolored uh, appearance of a flower, that multicolored aspect doesn't even exist in the flower, it only exists in our eye consciousness. Mm -hmm. 
and so when we when we look at a flower with a uh, an extremely strong microscope, for example, right now we look at the flower and we see something very beautiful, something colorful, and so on. But when you look at it with uh, a microscope, a very powerful microscope, forget about seeing petals or uh, uh, stamen and so on. You can't even see. You get to a point where you can't even see the larger uh, particles and atoms. You're getting even more subtle than that. And so because of our uh, habitual tendencies, our mental inference and habitual tendencies to see things in a certain way, because of that, then So because of that, uh, then we see a flower in a certain way. And so because of these uh, mistaken mental inference, then we can see this uh, appearance of a flower. And so that which appears to a mistaken consciousness and is seen as true by a mistaken consciousness is what's called the fictitious truth. So um, it's seen as true by a mistaken mind or a confused mind. And so when we actually examine the true nature of the flower and realize that the flower does not truly exist, then that is the ultimate truth of the flower. And so to understand Madhyamaka, to understand the middle way philosophy, we first need to understand the presentation of the two truths. <laughs> In the root verses of wisdom, or the fundamental verses of wisdom of Nagarjuna, he says that if you don't have an understanding of the two truths, then you can't understand the profound wisdom of the Buddhas. So uh, many people think when we say that all phenomena, all things are emptiness, uh, and they believe that, then they think that all of these um, things that appear to us, that appear to our mistaken consciousness, uh, forms, sounds, smells, and so on, they absolutely don't exist. They're utterly non-existent. And, uh, but then others think that you know, all of this environment, all of these beings in the environment, all the sounds, smells, tastes, 
uh, and so on, all of them appear to us. And because they appear to us, they can't be empty because we see them, right? We see the forms, we smell the smells, we hear the sounds. So they can't be emptiness because they appear to us, right? And so these are the two views, the two extreme views. And, uh, and so in order to understand the, uh, sorry, so we need to abandon these two extreme views and be able to understand the two truths. And the reason why people have these two extreme views is because they haven't really understood the, the presentation of the two truths. ตาอันนี้ตาตะกองเลยจะมาได้บาคีเอ่อเดซอนเยอะอืมชิลูมินาเดลอมาตะกุนตุนกุนจีซานเจจิทัมจีอยู่จิซอมบายซินานิจิต
hear sounds, taste things, and so on. And those experiences or those uh, consciousnesses then are non-deceptive in terms of their objects, and that's why they are referred to as true in terms of this fictitious truth. They are true to the mistaken consciousness. They are non-deceptive in terms of acquiring or perceiving their object, uh, though that is a mistaken consciousness, and that's why it is referred to as the conventional or fictitious truth. And that's why the word truth is employed here. And But when you think of it in terms of the ultimate truth, in terms of the true reality of things, then uh, those things do not truly or naturally inherently exist. And that natural, uh, that absence of an inherent or natural existence or a true reality, true existence then, is also non-deceptive in terms of the way things really are. And that's why it's referred to as the ultimate truth. So that non-deceptiveness in terms of reality true reality uh, is why that is called the ultimate truth. Again, the word truth. So taking one flower then, taking this flower as an example, we see it with our eyes, we smell its scent, and that those uh, senses are non-deceptive. We have not been deceived by that. But that is non-deceptive to a mistaken consciousness. So that is the conventional truth of that flower. And so, uh, but <clears throat> um, the way that they appear to that mistaken mind is not the way that we grasp that with that mistaken mind, the way that it appears or the way that we see that is not the way that it truly exists. And that lack of true existence or natural or inherent existence then is the ultimate reality of the flower. So that's the two truths in terms of one object, the two truths of the flower. Malangan <laughs> The <laughs> Gado Tatta Malam <laughs> So it's just like the appearances in a dream. So when you're dreaming then at nighttime, uh, you can see many mountains, different lands, cities. Uh, you can dream about anything. And until you awaken from that dream, everything that appears in that dream seems real. It's real to you. And so whatever you dream about, you can dream about various lands, various friends. Uh, and until you wake up from that dream, we can have 
uh, all of the various sensations and feelings of happiness, sadness, suffering, and so on. All of those are there uh, while you are sitting there dreaming. But while you're in that dream, and the place in which you are asleep, for example, in your home, you're sleeping, and in that home, none of those things that you're dreaming of, those other cities, those other lands, those other people, none of those exist. None of those are truly established in that place where you are asleep. Uh, they are merely appearing to you in the dream. And so similarly now, it's like we're in a dream. We are in that sleep of ignorance and confusion, of confused consciousness, which is uh, afflicted us. We are afflicted by ignorance, which is like a darkness of sleep. And it's as if we are having a dream. And so all of these mistaken appearances, all of these things that appear to a mistaken mind, until we can abandon that mistaken consciousness, all of those things will continue to appear as if they were true to us. Um, <clears throat> so, but just like how in the dream, while they're dreaming, none of the things that they're dreaming about are truly existing or truly established. Uh, similarly, everything that appears to our mistaken consciousness, it all appears to us and appears as if it were true though it does not truly exist, though it's not truly established. Last one, I can receive. ตะเนตะตะสันเดนโดกนานะมะตะนาวะหายะเซมะมิเกตะลุตันเยเจเซมะมิกะตะวอมบนตะตะเซยินะพอบะลัมจิโซเลจิจิซาซันนะตะติล
phenomena of samsara and nirvana are merely appearances of dependent origination, of interdependence. And they are not truly existing in the way that they appear. And so what we call the middle way or the Madhyamaka is the union or the unity of dependent origination and emptiness. And so, <clears throat> um, so most people, most ordinary beings either grasp to a, an extreme of permanence, which is that everything truly exists. They believe that things truly exist or they believe in a view of annihilation, which is that everything's empty, nothing exists. And so then the real middle way then is that one neither abides in the views of the extreme view of permanence nor annihilation, but it is then the unity then of dependent arising, uh, dependently arisen uh, appearances interdependence, uh, interdependence, and the fact that those interdependently arisen appearances do not truly or inherently exist. And so the unity of those is what's called the middle way. And the middle way is, as we said before, neither abiding in existence nor non-existence. <laughs> So the middle way then is to neither to fall into the extreme of the belief in the existence of those uh, interdependent appearances, nor to fall in the extreme of uh, that being sorry, that first part being the conventional truth or the fictitious truth, so not to fall into the, the, the one side of the fictitious truth, nor to fall entirely into the other side, which is the ultimate truth of emptiness. So neither abide in either of those extremes, but uh, in the union of those two is what's called the middle way. <laughs> So Milarepa has said that the meaning of the uh, the middle way is the union of profound emptiness and, and dependent arising, and that to realize that union is to realize the ultimate meaning or the uh, profound emptiness and the real meaning of emptiness being that union of emptiness and appearance, and that is the realization of the middle way. Did you understand about the two truths then? So the point then is the uh, the fictitious or conventional truth then is that which is non-deceptive to a mistaken consciousness. And so uh, non-deceptive to a mistaken consciousness means that uh, 
that that consciousness, uh, sorry, that is the kind of definition of the conventional truth or the mistaken or fictitious truth is that which is non-deceptive to a mistaken mind. And the definition or the, the description then of the ultimate truth is that which is uh, non-deceptive to the true reality. In terms of true reality, what is non-deceptive is referred to then as the ultimate truth. And so the ordinary beings, the ordinary unenlightened being, their consciousness together with all of the objects of its consciousness are fictitious truth or conventional phenomena. Because that consciousness of an ordinary person is still infected with ignorance. So it is a mistaken consciousness which has been infected by ignorance. And so everything that appears to an ordinary person together with the mind which it's appearing to is con conventional or fictitious truth. And then everything, uh, the consciousness, the mind, as well as all of the objects of that mind, of an Arya being or an awakened being, are the ultimate truth. And the ultimate truth then, as we said before, is that which is non-deceptive in terms to, of the true reality. And so in the afternoon, we're going to talk about some of the logical reasonings of the middle way. And if you can understand some of those reasonings, there's really great benefit in that.